Hello and welcome to Walking in the Word. Today we're going to talk about a subject that's not the most popular subject to discuss. It is the Jordan River's end of life section. So we're going to look at the Jordan emptying into the Dead Sea. But even though it's called the Dead Sea, believe it or not, there are qualities in the Dead Sea that refer to spiritual life and even preservation. And so, Alton, would you start us out on this conversation? Okay. On our trip down the Jordan, we've started out at Mount Hermon, 9,200 feet high. And by the time we get to the bottom of it, we are going to reach a below sea level depth of 1,300 feet at the surface of the Dead Sea. And then another 1,300 feet to the bottom of the Dead Sea, which comes out to 2,600 feet below sea level. And ironically, Jerusalem is 2,600 feet above sea level. So you add them together, there's a mile difference. Okay? And God doesn't, you know, the, one of the definitions of Jordan is a river of judgment. But another one is that it's a descending situation. And from top to bottom, all rivers descend. That's how they get to the ocean. Problem with the Dead Sea is there's no way for it to get to the sea. It's landlocked by mountains. And so <clears throat> the only way that it can empty out is evaporation. And the water, the life-giving substance of water evaporates, but it leaves all the salts. So when we talk about rivers, we think of them as being fresh water, and they are. But it's, it's a degree of freshness. They are picking up salts and chemicals all along the way from the, from the earth and depositing them into a basin that has no way of getting rid of it. So the concentration just keeps building up so that um, the salt content of the Dead Sea is approximately 33% whereas ocean water is only 4 to 6 percent. And so these different parallels that seem to show themselves as you uh, make your way down the river, you got your birth, you got your teenage years, you got your uh, young adult years, you got your middle age, and today we're going to talk a, l a little bit more about what we would determine and say old age. Um, we discussed how the river meanders around at this point, and it, it takes 200 miles of zigzagging for it to uh, cover just 60 miles of distance. And, and you know, you can, the water is beginning to get more and more what scientists would call turbid. Uh, it's it's not undrinkable, but it's not really uh, it's not really what you want to put in your mouth. It's it's kind of like dishwater, and so. <clears throat> but a lot of critical things happened in this section of the river. Okay, Israel crossed in this area. Um, the, the priests put their foot in the water, carrying the ark. And the water is backed up to a town called Adam. So we can see that the river of judgment, that judgment backed up to Adam. Israel was going across into the promised land and starting a new thing in the earth. And this is also where Elijah crossed. And he, it says he smote the river with his mantle. And him and Elisha went across on dry shot. He went up in the whirlwind, and Elisha came back across, did the same thing, 
and got the promise that if he saw Elijah go up, he would have a double portion. And so a ministry was ending and a new one was beginning. Elijah represents John the Baptist. Elisha represents Jesus. And you know it's, it's ironic, everybody says, well, he died. Yeah, he did. They put him in a hole. But was he dead? Because they dropped a dead soldier in there because they didn't have time to bury him. And when he touched Elisha's bones, he came back to life. So when you come in contact with Jesus, you're going to start a new resurrected life. And, and people have to understand that the cross is, was critical. It's important. Don't minimize it. But if you stay there, you're not moving on with God. He wants you to become uh, acquainted with his resurrected life. Okay? You become a new creation man. All things are passed away and all, all things are become new. And so, um, you know, a lot of times people like to quote Hebrews 9.27. It's appointed unto man once to die. But you need to read the whole thing. That's talking about Jesus. You're not going to keep crucifying him over and over again. It was an appointed unto man for, for Adam to die if he sinned. And Jesus is the one who took the hit for us. Everything you saw happen to him on the cross, you had coming and I had coming. And so he did it for us. Okay? Um, so what happens? You die in the baptism tank. You, It says in Romans 6 that we are buried with him in baptism and that we're, we're uh, buried in the likeness of his death. In other words, he's saying you don't have to go get yourself nailed to a cross and get a crown of thorns on you and all these things and have all that shame. I'm taking it for you. But then it says that you will be raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, I don't know what kind of Bible you own, but a lot of them, if certain words are not in the original, they're just there to make sense in our language, then they're written in italics or they might be bracketed in or something. It says that we're planted in the likeness of his death, but that part about it being a likeness of his resurrection is not there. Okay, you're going to be of resurrection. Your resurrection is going to be real. It's not going to be a likeness. Okay, so sometimes we need to really buckle down and study what it really says. And so it says, but after this, the judgment. Okay, judgment, in my opinion, gets a bad rap because all people think about is standing before a judge and him condemning you to something. Judgment is, in your life, finding out which path to take, judging what's right according to God's word and his Holy Spirit, and moving in that direction. So judgment is a good thing. Sometimes you go to court and, and, and the judge straightens things out on your behalf. And so... You died in the baptism tank. When you come out, you get the Holy Ghost. You get a newness of life. Everything that was in your past is dealt with. You do not have to go back there anymore. We like to, it seems, or we let Satan remind us, but that's to get us off our game. You know, when you play a sport, if you're really good at something, the best way for the other guy to, to beat you is to start trash talking you, okay? Your mama this or something, and get you all mad, and you get off of your game. That's all Satan can do. He cannot. A lot of people think he's got all this power over you. Only if you give it to him, only if you listen to him, 
he don't have to listen to him. Okay? And as you come out of that water and that Holy Ghost begins to take over in your life, and now when you read the Word of God, it will begin to make more sense. And you'll be able to connect things, different parts of the Bible. Okay? When they went into the land, the Lord had to go with them because they didn't have the power to overcome these giants and these other enemies. But with God, you see, uh, uh, Caleb said, it says Caleb and Joshua were of a different spirit. Okay, they said we're more than able. In the Greek, dunamis means you're able. You have ability. We're more than able to go up and possess the land. So what's, what's the modern day promised land? My vessel, your vessel. You can get sin out of you. We talk about that Jesus died on the cross and my sins are forgiven. That's only half of it. He, he told Israel, I'm going to bring you out of Egypt that I might bring you in. Okay, a lot of people like getting out of Egypt, but they don't seem to hit the drag them kicking and screaming for 40 years to get them into the land. And, and that shouldn't be. We should want to cooperate. And, and he wants to help us drive out these Amorites and Girgashites and Jebusites, and I call them parasites. <laughs> okay, all these things that so easily beset us. Uh, he wants to help us get those things out of us. Because the wages of sin is death. And if you have a job that doesn't give you a living, go find you another job. Okay? So if the wages of sin is death and you don't like that pay, then get rid of sin because it's what's causing your sickness, your death, and everything that, that uh, you don't want to have. So, you know, you possess your vessel. And then in Paul, in 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Okay, when you go to college, you have courses. You want to get the diploma, you got to finish your course. Okay, he says, I finished it. I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown. Okay, and he says it's for everybody. Now this crown... The Greek word is Stephanos. You remember Stephen, the first martyr? Stephanos. They're stoning him, and as they're stoning him, he says that he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. In Psalm 110, it says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until... I make all thine enemies thy footstool. So, what do we see? Stephen is taking on the same attitude that Jesus did on the cross. Jesus said, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Stephen said, lay not this sin to their charge. And then he gave up the ghost. Okay, um, why was Jesus able to stand up? Because all the enemy in Stephen was made his footstool. And so he was able for Stephen to stand up and receive him. Okay? And this, um, you know, for years, people looked at the book of Revelation and they thought the four horsemen of the apocalypse had to do with the beast. Wrong. Eh, whatever the game show says. These are sent by God. Okay, and, the, and if you don't believe me, the very first guy, the white horse, he's wearing a crown. Look up the word Stephanos, the victor's crown. That only goes to righteous people. Okay, the only time it's used is, I think, in uh, whenever the angel comes up out of the pit, it says he had a crown like a Stephanos. Okay, he's always trying to imitate and uh, 
counterfeit what God does. It's the finals is on that white horse rider. And he sends, goes forth, conquering and to conquer. Okay. Um, so, to go a little bit farther than that, I'm going to turn it over to Nancy now. And she's going to expand on that a little bit for you. And hopefully you'll like what she has to say. And it'll speak to you. Thank you, honey. So, yes, speaking of crowns. I want to take us into the book of Proverbs, chapter 16. We're going to see Stephanos appear one more time. The gray head is a crown of glory, if it be found in the way of righteousness. So Proverbs, of course, is Old Testament. That means it was written in the Hebrew language. But if you take a Septuagint and you transfer from Hebrew into Greek, not into English, but into Greek. The word here that's used is Stephanos. So let's break this verse down. Verse 31 of Proverbs 16. The gray head is a Stephanos if it is found in the way of righteousness. Now taking us back to where we are geographically in this river course, the Jordan River empties into, you could say it dies in the Dead Sea. That is the end of the line for the Jordan River. So we associate gray hair with the elderly ages of life, like we talked about last time. But now we're to the end of the course of the river. So gray hair paralleling with the end of our lives. Gray hairs can be associated with the Stephanos overcoming victorious life of a righteous man or a woman. That's why Solomon called it in the book of Proverbs, a crown, gray hair is a crown, if it's found in the righteous way. So as we talked about last time, the elder people in our lives who especially are believers you can see the evidence of Stephanos in their lives. I don't know about you, but there are people, elderly people in my lives who, who in my life who have been believers for years, for decades. They, they've followed the Lord. And I can almost see, as I look at them, I can almost see an aura of the glory of God that surrounds them, especially their faces. So I'm not so sure, but what Solomon was referring to that very thing, there's an actual aura of the glory of God that surrounds an elderly person who has followed the ways of the Lord for years and years. And that crown of glory surrounds them. Unregenerate Unregener man, unregenerate man has very little positive to say about death, but as Alton just explained, death to self makes way for resurrection life in us. So experiencing death to the sin nature and resurrection life in baptism changes our focus completely from the dread of, of death, of the concept of death, especially dying to self, which is a daily thing, to the hope and the expectation of more of the glory of God in us. So instead of just emptying oneself in an unregenerate state into and yielding to death, we have the hope of looking forward and focusing on the new life that will spring out of death. So let's look at some of the real examples of this concept, this parallel from the Dead Sea itself. As we said last time, the 33% salt solution that the Dead Sea is, 33% of the water is salt. That's amazing, the content of it. So we see that in that condition, there's not a lot of life that can survive one third of, of its content being salt solution. 
But interestingly enough, as Alton said, the only outlet for the Dead Sea is evaporation into the air. And so guess what? All of those salts and minerals evaporate into the atmosphere. That's why skin doctors in Israel will literally prescribe time in the sun, in, in near the Dead Sea, not in the Dead Sea, but near it. They'll prescribe their patients, go sit 20 minutes by the Dead Sea every day at a certain time of day because they know the effects of the salt being evaporated into the atmosphere and the, and the effects of sunlight on that and how it can have healing properties for skin conditions. How amazing is that? That the Dead Sea offers preservation and even healing for life itself. Also, on the bottom of the Dead Sea forms natural asphalt. Now we think of asphalt in these days, we think of what is spread on a roadbed. It's a tarry substance. Well, natural asphalt is a tarry substance. And so it has been for centuries. The bottom of the Dead Sea, the asphalt has been mined and actually chunks of it float to the surface and they're called asphalt blocks. Those pieces of asphalt are mined and have been for centuries. The Romans actually called the Dead Sea the Asphalt Sea. And so the asphalt was taken, mined from the Dead Sea, collected off the surface in the bottom of the Dead Sea, and it was used as pitch to seal wooden vessels. So think about that. You make a barrel, you pitch it on the outside with asphalt, you're good to go. It can hold water. On the other hand, you pitch the outside and the bottom of a ship with asphalt from the Dead Sea, and guess what? Your vessel's now watertight. Sailors are not gonna sink in the, in the water and drown. So again, think about this. From the Dead Sea comes something that preserves real life. Amazing. It's just an amazing, the analogies there. And one more fact. Egypt also mined and paid a lot of money for the asphalt from the Dead Sea because it was used to mummify the dead. <laughs> Think about that. We don't want to try this. <laughs> but in wanting to preserve the actual physical flesh, the body of a person that had died, as they then wrapped them up um, and sent them to the afterlife, whatever, they would put asphalt on the actual skin of these corpses and it would preserve the skin on them for centuries, even, even now. That skin is still preserved. So it's an amazing concept, such an ironic and a paradoxical thing that the Dead Sea can produce life. It can produce, preserve, it can and bring preservation to life in some ways. So this asphalt is removed. It has to be removed from the surface because the asphalt is made up primarily of carbon, which is produced from dead, decayed plants and small animals. And so that represents corruption. Corruption has to be taken off of our lives, period, so that life can come forth so corruption is equal to death. If we were to look at 1 Corinthians 15, 26, we see that that verse tells us that the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Nothing that can produce more corruption. Death will be destroyed. There is nothing that can produce corruption in us at that point. So daily, we must choose life. Daily, we must choose life. We want God to take the asphalt out of us, off of us, and get rid of that. We want to yield that to him. 1 Peter 1, verses 7 through 9, 7 and 9 in particular, I want to read this from the Amplified. The trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perishes. Now, let me stop for a minute and explain. The process of purifying gold or silver works like this. The chunks of that metal 
are heated to a very high temperature, they're melted down in a cauldron, and then there's a skimmer that's used that as the impurities float to the surface, they're skimmed off. The process is repeated over and over again. The more the gold goes through the fire, so to speak, the more pure it is. And so Peter used this analogy because it was a common thing for people to purify precious metals. And so he says, the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perishes, but being proven through fire might be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation. The word is apocalypsis. They're revealing the taking off of the veil, the cover, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then the end of verse eight says, believing in him, you exult in unspeakable joy and having been glorified. In other words, having taken on the weight of God's glory in your life. Verse nine says, obtaining the end. And this three-letter word end is so very significant. If you look up the word end, it means the goal, the point aimed at, what you're trying to accomplish, in other words, obtaining what you're trying to accomplish by your faith, even the salvation of your souls. We know that when you accept Jesus into your life as your Savior, that's not the end of the process. That's just the very beginning. The salvation process that our soul goes through day after day, year after year, is the process of being purified, just like gold would be purified. That the death, the corruption, we, we would allow him, we would yield to his hand and let him remove that from us, just like asphalt being taken from the Dead Sea. And in our case, what is left behind is the residue of life. His deposit of life then has more room to fill us because corruption as it goes, what's being replaced with that is the life, the resurrection life of the Lord Jesus Christ. So at the, at the point, the end of the life of the Jordan River, even that carries the potential of preserving life. Revelation 2.10, Jesus says this. He promises this. He says, be faithful unto death. Be faithful to the very point of death, and I will give you the crown, the Stephanos of eternal life. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the Stephanos of life. So one last fact in the closing minutes of our program about the Dead Sea that I found very interesting. In the 2018 newspaper called the Times of Israel, a reporter that had done research on the Dead Sea claims, watch this now, that the location of Sodom and Gomorrah is at the bottom of what? guess what? The Dead Sea. The south end of the Dead Sea is where those accursed cities are permanently buried. It's the high sulfur content found in the asphalt of the Dead Sea would simply strengthen that because as we know in Genesis 19 where it's recorded, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was by what? God's fire and brimstone. Obviously, sulfur is a byproduct of that. So how interesting and fitting that the final burial place of the accursed cities Sodom and Gomorrah most likely is in the bottom of the Dead Sea. So with that, we are going to close for today, but we trust that this has been inspiring, encouraging, something that will give you food for thought until we meet again. And so God bless you. We thank you for the time that you spent with us. Choose life daily. Take that away from today. Choose life daily. So we send our love to you. Until next time, in Jesus' name.
Right in the fire, he makes us all.